Right, uh, let's get started. Uh, sorry for the room confusion. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michel, um, and I'm a federal contributor, and I'll be talking about uh, these two tools, uh, eBranch and uh, PKG DevGraph, which will be a general dependency graph library. So let's start with some introduction. <coughs> um, I've been a federal contributor since about 20 years ago. I've been in Apple's steering committee for a while. I'm a new member of FESCO, which is the Federal Engineering Steering Committee. I'm in various uh, packaging um, interest groups, um, Apple, Python, uh, RAS, and Golang. Um, I started the Lua um, packaging group, but we have not really done much with it yet. And uh, we just announced the ButterFS uh, special interest group um, last week. It's still currently information. And I've been uh, working in, in Meta for, uh, as a production engineer um, for the past seven and a half years, including some stint. You might remember my first uh, vlog talk was actually like uh, about desktop Linux stuff, which I don't do anymore. Um, let's start with um, a little segue into, you might have seen this before, it's quite famous, like a uh, falsehood programmers believe about names. I'm listing a subset that applies to me. People's names don't change. Um, if, you, if you see my um, fast like a nickname or if you know me like uh, from a few years ago, I used to be Michelle Salimman and now Michelle Lind. People's names are assigned at birth unless you change your name, right? Okay, maybe, you know, like, you don't change your name after a while, right? Within a year, within five years, <laughs> you're kidding. The funny thing is when I change my name, my new name is uh, one letter shorter, which makes a uh, priority pass think that, oh, now we can print your whole middle name instead of just your middle initial, which was wrong, they're off by one. So they chopped my uh, middle name off by one letter. So <clears throat> those are about names. This is about packaging. You know, like um, in an ideal world, right? Like uh, you have a package, the dependencies in the spec is accurate, right? So if you rebuild the, uh, the spec like uh, for a different like uh, distribution and you know, like uh, Mark says, yeah, your root dependencies are fine. The build should be fine, right? No. <laughs> well, how about this? Okay, the list of dependencies is, you know, like uh, up to date. Um, if there are version constraints, are the version constraints up to date? Your package might say, oh, I, I need, you know, library, library foo version five. And then when you build, it fails at runtime. During compile time, it says, no, I actually need version six. Um, we, there are efforts to make it like uh, to at least address this point. Like uh, RAS and Python and Fedora generally use uh, dynamic build, re build requirements. So the spec doesn't list what it requires. It's computed um, based on the upstream uh, metadata. Or, you know, you assume upstream knows what they're doing, so surely the upstream declared uh, version constraints are valid. Sometimes, you know, like uh, in Rust especially, like, oh, you know, like um, I'm bumping it, um, I'm bumping everything to the latest version, even though I don't, I don't actually need it. Or sometimes, like you see this in Python a lot, like I need version five or above, like no constraint. And then, you know, version seven come out like uh, two years later and turns out the API actually doesn't. Uh, it's not compatible anymore. Or, well, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm bumping from like 501 to 502. It should be fine, right? Like, uh, well, right? <laughs> and um, most relevant for us, like for me anyway, like uh, in terms of eBranch and PKG dev, uh, dev graph, when, you know, like you have Fedora and like uh, every few years, um, like a new enterprise Linux release come along and it's like, you know, like uh, you're, you might be branching like, you know, like some packages to um, distribution that's a bit older and it should be fine, right? It's just rebasing everything. Now forget all that because if you, if you want to fix everything, you know, like it will, every, nothing will ever work. Assume that we have good metadata. What can we do to like uh, say, hey, you know, like I have like, um, I have um, upstream software and I want to bring it into like Fedora or I have Fedora packages and I want to bring them into Enterprise Linux. 
let's look at the life cycle of different Linux distributions. If you use Fedora, you know that, you know, like, uh, we, it's supported for about 13 months. Like, uh, when Fedora 40, 40 came out a few months ago, a month after that, we cut off support for Fedora 38. And for Fedora, like, um, whenever there's a new version, basically all packages that are not broken automatically get um, branched for the next release. For CentOS uh, Stream and uh, Red Hat Enterprise and all the derivatives, um, not all of these packages become available because if you're Red Hat, you don't want to be on the hook for maintaining uh, these packages for years for your paying customers. Stream is supported for only five years. RHEL is supported for 10 plus years. Like uh, RHEL 7 is still supported if you pay Red Hat for it. And yeah, I think uh, 9 is going to support it for like 12 years-ish. This is not official, this is from end of life date, which is normally correct, plus minus one week or so. So, <clears throat> if packages are not in RHEL or Stream, because uh, obviously Red Hat doesn't want to maintain the entire world for like, um, for 12 years. You can package them in Apple. But, you know, like um, a lot of federal packages don't understand Apple or they don't really want to deal with it if they understand it because they're like, oof, that's a long commitment. And, you know, like um, what um, between like uh, new CentOS stream and RHEL gets released every three years, a lot of things change like uh, in three years, right? Like. Uh, if a package is there as a dependency for something else, three years down the road, it might not be relevant anymore. So Apple starts off empty. It's a blank state every release, which means we have a bootstrapping problem. Yay. Uh, there's talk about making it uh, nicer for the Apple 11 timeframe. Um, if you are interested in that, like uh, join our ELN meetings every two weeks on Fridays. So the bootstrapping problem. How do we bring in hundreds or you know thousands of packages? You know, like uh, remember, like these are normally like you might be interested in like ten packages, and then all the rest are just dependencies that you marginally care about. Um, so there is this tool called eBranch, which I use a lot for bringing up uh, Apple Nine. I presented it at uh, CentOS Dojo at Fosdem two years ago, and it's been used successfully over the past two years to bring hundreds of packages. Um, for example, like uh, most of the Rust bring up for Apple 9 that I do, uh, that I did was using eBranch, including, you know, like um, around like close to 100 packages like uh, per set. Um, so yeah, um, I mentioned earlier that um, Rust and Python um, has like a dynamic uh, build requirements which works fine. Like um, in any system with a new-ish RPM version, it doesn't work in um, Enterprise Linux 8 where RPM is too old. And it should be easy to add like uh, for like some other like um, ecosystems that have similar like language package manager as like Rust and Python, like uh, Lua. It's just that, you know, like between time commitments, it hasn't happened yet. And you know, like uh, a lot of like uh, open source software now, like I use um, um, Meson as a build system, and it might be doable to do this. It would be nice to actually like make it easier to say backport GNOME from like Fedora to uh, CentOS. But the problem is that Meson is Turing complete, so you, it, it's not as like uh, easy to just parse it. And let's not talk about CMake. <laughs> So yeah, like, um, so because of dynamic build requirements, you cannot just say, hey, take a spec and like um, parse it and like uh, look at the build dependencies and just say, well, okay, those are what we need to like um, rebuild this package in another this row. Uh, you basically have to generate the stub RPM that actually contains the real dependencies that you need. Uh, and apparently there is a PR right now to make it easier to actually uh, output this thing because right now you basically just have to run it in mock and mock will generate this. And there's no way to tell mock right now to just generate that and stop. Or you can just say, well, you know, like I don't really, I can just piggyback on what uh, the DNF repository metadata already has 
instead of parsing the spec. So this is kind of why, like, initially I wanted to actually just use uh, F branch, which uh, Jens Peterson developed. But at the time, uh, F branch basically naively parses spec files, and basically, so it's useless for uh, Rust and Python. So E branch basically use uh, repo query data. And then you have the next problem with bring ups in that you don't actually own most of these packages because you don't actually care about them. And some of these packages, um, in some ecosystems, uh, they are group maintained. So as long as you're in the group, you can branch and build anything. Uh, in some others, uh, basically, you know, you have to beg someone who is on the access control list to say, hey, can you branch this for me, please? And we are all terrible at reading emails, including me. So, you know, like uh, Bugzilla emails often go to death now. Or some maintainers don't understand this Apple thing and like, or like, why do I care? Why do I want to do this? Or like, well, you know, if I do this, like, do I get all the Apple bugs I don't care about? And yeah, like uh, some packages, like uh, when I was bringing up like a uh, uh, mailman for the mailing list stack for Apple 9, some dependencies are like 10 layer deep, right? And you have to keep, you know, like convincing like maintainers one by one. It will take forever and it's an unbounded time, like so you'll never get done. Uh, we have a policy fix. Not everything needs to be fixed in code, right? So we have a process for dealing with stalled requests. So now it takes like um, three weeks maximum if you remember to actually like escalate when uh, something is stalled. If you don't remember, then well. <laughs> uh, so eBranch also has this ability to actually say, hey, you know, given this list of packages I, I'm trying to follow up on, hey, this one has been like uh, there for like a week, it's time to follow up. And it can ping Bugzilla on its own. I didn't put in the ability to actually like talk to like a Pagur yet. So it will spit out a template that you can file to Relange to say, hey, you know, like um, um, it's been here for like three weeks. I want to get access to the package, please. And it's a first uh, step at actually doing this, right? So there are various horrible shortcomings in this. It's, you know, quick and dirty. Like I need it to actually like um, uh, get working because I need to like um, show it at like a CentOS uh, dojo. It only does one thing. It only, it's only really basically narrowly focused on like, I have packages in Rawhide um, as, like a, as my reference and I want to build them for Apple. And because it's a quick and dirty solution and because there was no good library to this at the time, and I don't want to deal with DNF force, like uh, Python bindings, which is a tiny shim around the C like implementation, I, it shells out to like uh, Neil's uh, RPM distro repo query, which is basically a tiny wrapper around DNF in bash that just like uh, basically pointed to the right like um, a set of uh, uh, repo definitions instead of just the Fedora ones that you have on your machine. So it's very slow. It's uh, eBranches in Python. It shells out to RPM distro repo query, which is bash. RPM distro repo query invoke DNF. And you know, if you are trying to compute the transitive closure of like all your missing dependencies, that's a lot of shelling out. And Python is infamously not very fast, actually, like you know, like a, to invoke a CLI from like a, from scratch. Because right, like it's still better like um, when you're writing the code than dealing with DNF or uh, Python API. But when you're computing that, it feels a bit painful. Like uh, you know, you can start it running you know, like uh, running it in a loop and then like uh, you leave and make coffee. And yes, um, FedRQ now does this, but FedRQ didn't exist two years ago. So, <clears throat> so now I'm splitting um, off like a new library, which basically say like, hey, you know, like if we are just dealing with DNF repositories, uh, just use FedRQ. But you know, you can use this without knowing about FedRQ internals. So we also, that means we also don't need to care about knowing about which distro is available, like how, you know, like, like uh, CentOS 8 has the power tools repo, which is called CRB in CentOS 9, and you don't have to care about it. Just say, I'm backporting from, you know, Fedora to CentOS 9, which includes Apple, like, uh, what do I need? Um, you don't have to care about, you know, DNF4, DNF5, because FedRQ support both. You just have to flip it to use um, the right backend. 
So not only can we bring Fedora packages to um, Apple, you can also say, hey, you know, like I want to recompile this thing from Gohite to Fedora 40 or 39. Or you want to compile this to like another distro that's kind of like Fedora. And the idea being that it's not, currently it's just a shame around FedRQ to make it a bit simpler to use. But the idea is that the next step is to extend it so you can say um, when you're upgrading your package in Fedora, you, you also want to know what's in upstream, right? And it will tell you like, hey, you know, like uh, your Rust uh, package has a new crate um, on crates.io and it picks up three new dependencies and two dependencies that you have, but your version is too old. And likewise for Python and like uh, for Lua and whatever else. Um, there is nothing stopping you from using it to say, hey, I also want to use it for like, you know, apt repositories or, you know, like um, we have kind of like a shadow, we, uh, a way to like build up open source code at work and we can also basically teach PKG Debgraph to actually like um, deal with it. So we are keeping this generic. There are, you know, certain things, you know, it has a concept of package, it has a concept of a dependency, but basically we want to keep the API the same, whatever like a packaging backend you're dealing with. So <clears throat> the nice thing about using um, FedRQ is uh, dependency resolution is fast. Right? You can just say, hey, I want a uh, repo query like uh, configured for Rawhide, I want one for Apple 9. The first time you run it, it'll be a bit slow because it has to cache all the metadata. And then let's see, you know, hey, what do I need to build FedRQ? And, you know, with the repository data cache, it answers in like 0 0.004 seconds. And yeah, like um, as you can see, like the outputs basically, you know, like um, it's it's rich uh, dependency data, right? You can just you can you can have just like dependency as a package name. You can have one that has conditional, like oh, if this version is less than what, then like uh, have another dependency, or you can have like a dependency with uh, bounded versions. So uh, apart from eBranch, um, the idea is that I want to also. The first reason I wanted to have a library is because I have two different um, projects that need to use something like this. The other one is uh, packages of interest. The idea is being that in eBranch, you only care about branching a package. So, you know, like there are some packages that you temporarily care about, and after that, you don't really care about them so much. This is more about keeping track of packages you actually care about long term. So, like, you have a core set of packages that you actually need to use. You care about the dependencies insofar as you need them to actually be working, or if there is a bug, you need to know. But your list of dependencies might change over time. You also care about, hey, if you're maintaining a library and you update it, what could you potentially break? So there's a distinction between packages you actually care about and packages you indirectly care about. And this, it lets you like add, um, additional metadata, right? You might care about, hey, who am I packaging this for? Like, who actually asked for this? Um, you know, like, uh, how healthy is the upstream? How healthy is the package in Fedora? Like, um, are there open bugs? Are there open CVs? Or, you know, like, hey, you know, like, I packaged this two years ago. Like, uh, did I always want the latest version? Or do I want to stick to, like, a certain, like, a, what, what is my policy for upgrading this? So basically, you know, like offloading your brain in a way that's machine readable so you don't forget the next time you need to deal with it. And this is still in progress. Like uh, hopefully I'll, I'll have a bit uh, beta release by the end of the year. And yeah, if uh, this sounds of interest to you or you might need something that's a bit like this, um, please talk to me and we will make sure that, you know, as we develop uh, this library, it kind of uh, matches um, you know, the more people who use this, uh, the better. And if you want to try this now, wait two days. Um, I'm still making changes. Uh, there will be like an Apple Hackfest um, on Friday, which um, I hope to actually uh, use this for, to bring up Apple 10. And Maxwell has a FedRQ talk tomorrow. Um, so if you want to um, 
talk to me about this, I'll be at his talk as well. And there'll be an announcement on uh, Mastodon, like uh, when, uh, when this is released. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah, like I started a bit late, so like uh, let's try to wrap up. These are the to-do lists I plan to finish by Friday. Um, actually make it work for eBranch. Um, there is this need that we don't have right now to actually do remapping. So say you want to bring a uh, backport package from Fedora to Apple, but Apple 9's, uh, EL 9's uh, Python is getting old. It's uh, Python 3.9 and like um, setup tools 0 0.53. So a lot of newer software doesn't work on it yet uh, anymore. So you might need to build for Python 3.12. So you might want to say, hey, I want to backport things from Fedora, and whenever you see a Python uh, dependency, replace it with Python 3.12. And if it doesn't exist, then it's something you need to backport. Or, you know, like, hey, there's a policy in Rust saying, like, if you are backporting a compatibility library, you should also, to be nice, uh, backport the, the latest version as well. And there are some things I need to add, like contributing guide. Um, so, you know, like. <laughs> uh, so, a few things to note. This is a GPL2 or later project. Uh, PRs are welcome, but note that some things are still in flux and if you make changes to it, I might have to either reject your pull request or say, well, you know, like, uh, this will be, like, uh, different in a month. Do you really want to, like, uh, change this part? Um, protocol definitions, right now it only has one backend, so obviously, like, the API is not finalized yet. And, yeah, like, when I upload the slides, this will be links to uh, related projects. Yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Do you need the microphone? No, can I just shout it? Yeah. Under other consumers, you were talking about keeping notes about the purposes of your packages. Yes. Where are you trying to keep that data? Um, so um, it basically, it outputs, um, I think, YAML right now. So it's up to you. It's designed to basically, like, um, I use uh, Pydentic to basically enforce, like, um, serialization, like, uh, format. And you can basically, for me, like, I'm going to just dump it to this, kind of, like, uh, commit to a Git repo. But you can do whatever you want to do. Okay, so it's, it's wherever. I was wondering if it was in this kit, if you were building it in the Apple branch as a repo. Uh, the project is on, like, um, the project is on Pagure. Uh, there's a link for it in my, um, in the resources section. Uh, there is no, so the ones, uh, so the idea is that you kind of, like, I, I can put out some examples uh, later on. But for me, the idea is that I'm keeping track of things that I want, I need to uh, get working for work, so it's not really meant to be open. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I should put up some examples. Yeah, so the, the point is, internally you have to both ask, I really care about this package, and later on, I also work on that. And later on, it's hard to remember, oh, we, we, we do the effort to maintain this package because this team did it for this purpose, and over the years, this information gets lost. So that's where this came from. And it seems something that's useful enough to put it in a public project. Uh, so, with you having this thing for tracking reasons and stuff, um, have you thought about also adding uh, lifetime data? Like, how long is this, this going to be alive kind of thing? Uh, that's kind of what I was alluding for, for like the upgrading policy. But yes, I think that's, that's kind of separate, I guess. It's similar. Well, so like right. the reason I bring it up is that when I was working at Datto, we made a thing called EOL Tracker, mm -hmm. which allowed us to track and watch when something gets upgraded or maintained and link it both against its support lifetime as an individual component as well as the distribution's lifetime so that we would understand whether we should be where we can depend on it or whether we're able to depend on it and things like that. That's a good idea. Yeah, because right, like uh, some packages like Django is supported for like let's say three years mm -hmm. and you are in Apple which is, you know, five, well, well ten years and yeah. you need to know, oh, need, I need to make an incompatible change now. Or yes. in the other way around, you're bringing something and you're you're developing something, and you're trying to figure out what what is your API coverage that you can use, yep. and these are the kinds yes. of things you want to understand. All my dependency is uh, out of date now, like and it's end of life, and I need to do something. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, any other question? I think we're out of time. Yeah. 
we might be out of time. I, I don't see the next people, but yeah, let's be nice and finish. Oh, I think one more question. Sorry. Oh, so nobody's in the room, so we we might as well gain back our last five minutes. <laughs> well, well, or not. Or not. no more question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>